Hi guys, welcome back to VR Roundtable and welcome to the next installment of Deep Dives. Deep Dives, if you haven't seen one yet, is basically an opportunity for us to dig deeper into the details of a particular topic or subject without necessarily doing it on our show. For our show, we have maybe an hour and a half, up to two hours tops, and if we dug deep into everything we wanted to talk about, we would not have enough time. So with this particular segment of Deep Dives, I'm gonna be getting into artificial locomotion and what that means in a legitimate or a complete VR experience. Now, what got me on this subject was playing Resident Evil 7. Now, Resident Evil 7 is something that I absolutely loved. I thought it was an incredible virtual reality experience. I thought basically everyone should try it. Now I get that it's horror and I get that it may not be for everybody, but taking the genre out of it and experiencing the game for its complete polish this is a fully fledged title. As far as I know, this is really the first fully fledged title we, we have available in VR. And being able to experience that was frankly special to me. I, I, absolute, I absolutely adored it. And when I was playing the game and was real excited and would go onto message boards and Reddit and all sorts of things like that. and would, would read and, and I'd want to know what other people were thinking about the game. There would always be, I don't know, two out of every ten uh, responders that would say something like, well, well, it doesn't have motion control so Sony can keep it. Or um, it, it uses a gamepad so it's, it's not really VR. And I thought this was bizarre because I'm sitting here absolutely loving the game. And I get that some people may not like it, that's fine. I, I, I don't expect everybody to like one product, but dismissing it as a valid or legitimate and complete VR experience, maybe you know that's not correct. So it got me thinking, it made me want to do this deep dive, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to have some help from a very special guest that's going to demonstrate some of the pitfalls of artificial locomotion and what it means in the complete room scale uh, virtual reality experience. So uh, without further ado, let's say hi to my guest. Oh, it's Steve. Hi, Steve. How's it going? Hey, Steve. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is basically traversal locomotion. Um, it's one of the things in every Vive game, every room scale game, uh, and now a lot of Oculus Touch games that's going to present its problem you are in a room and even if you're fortunate to have a five by five space how how does that pan out so Steve how about going and walking over to that car oh I can't I ran out of room I must artificially walk that way Now I'm here. So one of the things that I believe makes something a valid virtual reality experience is really we have to explore what the word reality means. Now I don't intend to offend anybody here but if locomotion is required for, for something to be a reality if motion controls with your hands requires something to be a reality, then what about all of our disabled citizens of not just this country, but the world? If you, you know, happen to have whatever circumstances that led you to be in a position where maybe you couldn't walk or you didn't have the use of your hands and arms, does that mean you're not living in reality? No, of course not. You, that, is your, that is a reality. You are just physically unable to do certain tasks. So within VR, I believe that reality is basically the visual and audio perception 
when, when I don a, a, a VR headset, put on my HTC Vive or dig, dive into my PlayStation VR, what happens is my entire periphery is in this world. And, and it's not just a screen pressed against my face and pressed up against my eyeballs. It, it is using stereoscopic left eye, right eye depth and, and focusing and, and imagery so that I am perceiving depth. I am perceiving that, that objects in the foreground are closer than objects in the background. I am perceiving that, that whatever room or, or, or open area that I'm in, that it, that it seems to scale, like trees and bushes and, and furniture. It all feels like it is where it should be. So I think, and I, I wholeheartedly believe, that that is basically the minimal requirements for virtual reality. That, that all you have to do is be, have your visual and, and, and audio perceptions placed and transported to another place. So our next demonstration from Steve is going to be simply climbing a ladder and seeing how, how, how is that actually executed. Now, I noticed that you are doing that by just moving your arms. You're not really touching anything. You're not really grabbing anything. You're just kind of putting your arms in that general motion. Now, in my opinion, a valid or a complete virtual reality experience will use multiple of our five basic senses. Visual and audio, otherwise known as hearing. Those two are covered in, in, in virtual reality. And I think those two for now are all it takes for a complete virtual reality experience. The other three though, which is taste, smell, and touch can be used, could be used, but aren't currently being used in the same way. Now, you could argue that touch kind of fits into this area that I'm discussing and why motion controls are critical. Motion controls kind of itch at that element of touch, but it's also artificial and incomplete. If, if I'm playing a game and I need to pick a baseball up off of the ground, I can bend down and I can pick that baseball up, but unfortunately, with current technology that's available to consumers, I'm doing it by squeezing a trigger or pressing a button. I'm not really doing it with my hand and grabbing the ball. Now, I'd imagine that at some point in the future, and I know the technology is already being worked on, that we'll have maybe perhaps some sort of glove or, or um, via uh, just a, a visual tracking system, we'll be able to see that my hand is doing the grab motion without a glove, and I'll be able to pick that object up in a more natural way. The downside there, though, is that I still don't feel it in my hand. If I'm doing this as I am right now, the ball is not there. If I had a HoloLens or some sort of augmented reality device and it projected a ball in my hand, I still can't feel it. It still doesn't have weight. So while I wish that was the case, it's currently not. And that not being the case, I don't believe makes a virtual reality or for that matter an augmented reality any less of a legitimate experience. So I have one more example that Steve's going to help me with and he's going to demonstrate a, a demo of Super Mario Brothers that was created by a gentleman uh, and I don't know his name right now but I will put it in the, uh, the, the credits of this video. Hey Steve. Yeah, as you can see I'm in Mario. So, in this demo, it doesn't use motion controllers per se, but that's not the point that I'm trying to get at. So, what happens is, is you need to press up on this controller, 
that's just telling the game because this is a simple demo but how he wants you to move is to actually walk so this is artificial I'm quote unquote walking and if I stop it stops and it's sensing you know obviously I don't have any controllers on my feet so it's sensing oh. Oh, miss them so what it's doing is it's sensing the head bob and then to jump basically I'm pressing this A button and it's telling the system I want to jump but then I actually have to jump so it kind of feels real let me see if I can break these coins okay. but I'm not I'm jumping much further in this game than I am in real life see I'm not jumping that high and it gives me a little floaty feeling so another example of the way locomotion has to be artificial in VR. Back to you, Steve. And as you can see with that third example, even though that demo did not have motion controls, it still represented the artificial aspects of a lot of locomotion. When he jumped, you know, he didn't need to press a button, and that's just how that particular demo was made. But when he jumped, he wasn't really being like Mario and jumping 10 feet in the air. Uh, much like a basketball game, you know, you, likely most VR consumers aren't going to be, are, are not capable of dunking a basketball in real life, yet that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a game where we can dunk a basketball and feel like Michael Jordan. So with that in mind, I think we need to look at a game and look at a title and look at it on its merits and not necessarily try to pick it apart based on whether or not it has motion controls or based on whether or not it has this little area. For me, Resident Evil 7 was a great game. Robinson the Journey was another example of this. It was really picked apart. Now, part of it was because Robinson held a, a object in his hand that looked just like a, a PlayStation Move controller. But that was, that was another great game. They, they fleshed out this world and, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And perhaps it would be better with motion controls. May, maybe not because you still can't explore in the same way. And to me, I think motion controls are, are gonna really hinge on a, a teleport function. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you like our channel, don't forget to subscribe or send me an email at vrroundtable at gmail.com. Thanks. See you next time.